this week on the Back Table Podcast. So what we started doing, um, and now I think we've done about five kids or so, is we get needles into the cyst. And like I said, it's a honeycomb, right? I use a kyphoplasty balloon to crack the whole system. So a cyst that's made up of like 50 cysts, I've cracked it, essentially making it a unilocular cyst, right? So I've made my ABC a UBC now, right? Because I've made yeah. 50 cysts into one because I've cracked yeah. it. And then I do the sclerosis and then I graft it. And then there are times, you know, there are like small cysts on the periphery, which I haven't been able to crack. I just kind of freeze those on the edge. And so now we're grafting ABCs by going in with a kypho balloon, cracking the whole thing and then grafting it. And once again, results are really neat thus far. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Backtable MSK podcast your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. This is Sabine Dond as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, interventional radiologist, Dr. Shankar Rajaswaran, coming to us from Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. Welcome, Shankar. How's it going, Sabine? (laughs) Good, good. You know, me and uh, me and Shunker go way, way, way back. If you can kind of hear, you know, Shunker has a little bit of a, of an accent. I mean, uh, give us a little bit of background. Where are you from, Shanks? Well, I'm originally from Papua New Guinea. And you actually, I remember on that first day of med school, came up to me and said, you sound funny. Where are you from? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I grew up in Papua New Guinea. And then I came to the States when I was 16. We, you know, it's a lovely country where we grew up playing kind of rugby and cricket, but kind of due to civil unrest, my parents opted to migrate and then I ended up in the States and we moved to the East Coast uh, to Philadelphia. Yeah. And how did you get from Philly to Chicago and in like pediatrics? I mean, how, where, give, give us a little life story there. So went to college out at Penn and then came to med school Northwest and that's where we hang out and we're best buds. And then I think it was our first year of med school, right? We were really fortunate because of the experience we had and, and the mentors we had in Northwestern to be exposed to interventional radiology pretty early on. I think it was our first year. And so like you, I was pretty gung ho knowing that I was going to do adult um, IR. So then we get into residency and we're both at Northwestern and you can recall, I think it was our second or third year of residency we got to rotate through the children's hospital. Um, and it was then there was an option to rotate through pediatric IR. And I got to do that. And um, my I was working under Dr. Donaldson, um, who happens to be one of the original um, fathers of pediatric IR. And he's actually the first president of the PEDS IR um, society. And then I was like, these patients seem cooler. You know, I got to work with kids. Um, and the cases we were doing were awesome. And I was like, I want to be this guy. So um, what I ended up doing is I did an adult IR fellowship with you um, at Northwestern. And then I went over to CHOP to do a second year in pediatrics. And then I came back to Lurie and now I'm in attending here. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. the thing is, is, uh, you know, I remember my pediatric rotation and, um, you know, all I was doing was, you know, pick lines and GJ tubes. I mean, what was it about peds? I mean, what, what got you? Cause I, I, you know, I did not know all this stuff that you're doing now, which I'd love to hear about, but like, how, how did you know pediatric IR was your field of what you wanted to do? You know, and I think it's back then it was kind of hit or miss in terms of seeing kind of good cases. And I think the day I was there, I happened to do a bunch of vascular malformations and and AVM and, you know, obviously that's skewed towards like the higher end um, type procedures that we do. And I was like, this is neat. So, and now like at our practice, that's kind of like part of our regular um, case mix. So it's definitely evolving. The uh, field has changed significantly, like from when I rotated to what it is now. Yeah. I mean, when we talk like uh, it's, it's amazing the stuff you do and, uh, I just uh, want to congratulate you, Mr. Uh, Division Head of Lurie Children's. Congratulations. Um, I'm, I'm expecting big things from you now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, don't, it all only happened in the last few weeks. And, you know, I, I think I was talking to you over FaceTime. I was like, 
I had to go through and this whole interview process with committees. It was like a national search. I was kind of stressed about the whole thing, but I guess they liked me enough to keep me on. Yeah. <laughs> so what is, I mean, you mentioned AVMs. I mean, what's, um, what, what are things that you love about pediatric IR? I mean, um, is it just AVMs? Is, is, is that your, your main, uh, squeeze or what? So, you know, Pediatric IR has changed so much since I was um, a resident to now being attending. So I can tell you like the first society formed, um, the Pediatric IR Society formed in like 2009. And back then they only had like 60 members. And now we're up to around 300 members in 22 countries, right? And so that's in the span of what, 12, 13 years, we've had that much growth. And then even like the amount of cases, when we were fellows back in 2014 or so, we were doing only about 2000 cases a year. And now we're up to about 3,300. So that's been like exponential growth in terms of the cases. Um, so in terms of cases that I really enjoy, you know, we, so our patients are obviously highly variable, right? I'm dealing with babies that are 600 grams, like a premature infant that comes out at 25 weeks, all the way to teenagers. So it's a lot of variability in terms of the outpatient sizes, as well as the cases we do. Um, we do everything I think that an adult IR does. Um, probably the only thing I don't do is PAD because kids don't get peripheral uh, arterial disease. But if I had things that I really enjoy, I really enjoy the vascular malformation work. I love um, the AVMs, um, which are the arterial venous malformations. We do a lot of bone work here um, that involves working with unicameral you know, bone cysts as well as aneurysmal bone cysts. Um, and the other thing that I really enjoy uh, something called Abernathy's, which are these congenital portosystemic shunts. So um, kids present with you know confusion, elevated ammonia levels, and it's because they have these huge shunts, which we can close from an endovascular standpoint. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, basically it's like a, like a, a shunt in, in a, in a serotic and, and then you're able to, you're able to close that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and our kids, they're not, our kids are generally not serotics, you know, yeah. so they, like normal livers, but they just happen to have this massive this shunt. Huge shunt. Yeah. yeah. What, um, you know, we're, we're going to get into bone cysts really soon, but I, I wanted to know, you know, um, just for our listeners, before we get into that, like, what, what are the challenges, I mean, of pediatric IR? I mean, it's, it's such a, you know, a field, a mystery field that, that most people don't know about. I mean, what are the challenges you see um, and, and how can students expose themselves to get there? Well, I can tell you like why I love these IR. So our patients are super fun, right? So you're working with kids and you get to know most Disney songs by heart. So if you ask me, I could probably recite Elsa's, uh, all Elsa's different songs to you. And there's a lot of satisfaction working with kids. The, the smallest case, you know, on the adult side, for example, let's just think about putting in a chessboard. It's for a family considered major surgery. And, you know, I distinctly recall this. It was my first year in, as an attending and I put in this chessboard. It took like 30, 40 minutes. And that's what I told the family it would take. But I kind of got distracted and I think I went up to the cafeteria and then I came back down and then I went and chatted them with them. And so that was like two hours later and I walked into the room and the family was bawling and I was like, what's the matter? And they said, you said it's 40 minutes, it's two hours. We thought there was a major complication and I like vehemently apologized. And then I just realized that things that we may take for granted are big things on the pediatric side, even things like just putting in a chest port. And so if I were to think about challenges, um, is working with six sick kids can be taxing, you know, in a given day, I'm probably seeing at least two kids with new diagnosis of some type of malignancy and just having to deal with families experiencing that knowledge for the first time can take an effect on you. You know, they don't make pediatric specific devices. That's, you know, one, I guess a complaint of mine. So I think it was this past week, I put in a port on a four kilogram child. That is the same port I would put on you, Beans. So they don't, they don't make pediatric devices, right? There's just not enough of a market. So you just have to find a way to kind of make it work. There are some cases which you just don't get the glory for, for example, like putting a pick line in, right? So a pick line, these kids need vascular access. 
And when you put it in a one kilogram child, it, they can be extremely challenging um, and can take, at times, may take an hour or two, right? Because they're that tiny. And people just may perceive it as just a pick line, but it's, it's challenging. And, you know, it's not infrequent that I have adult IRS text me who happen to also occasionally dabble in peds being like, do you have any secrets? And I'm like, no, just you have to probably do a pediatrics fellowship. <laughs> I, I remember the day I got good at ultrasound guidance was in my pediatric rotation. There's no yeah. doubt. I specifically remember following my needle into yeah. this damn little vein. And yeah. um, it was so hard, but it, everything just clicked in my head. When, yeah. when, I, when I got that. And, and from that day forward, I, I, it's one of the most useful things I ever learned it, it is my ultrasound guidance skills is, 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 is so much better. And it was, it was off the pick line. There, yeah. There's no doubt. I, I remember that day clearly. Um, and I remember trying to put in a port in, in some like one-year-old and it was so clunky, it, you know, to, to any industry that's listening to us. I mean, pediatric devices would be Awesome because it, it is hard. I, yeah. I, I give you kudos what you do. Um, and, and pediatric is a whole generation of kids, um, that, uh, that, that needs stuff. So yeah. kudos to what you do. That's definitely a challenge. And, and you guys are totally doing a great job. You know, we mentioned bone cysts. What, what the hell are bone cysts? I mean, are they like, like I, I've seen them on x-ray. They're cystic lucent lesions. What are they? How do they come? And why are they a problem? Okay. So bone cysts, the way I like to think of them is it's primarily a pediatric disease. And there's two types out there. There's one type that's called a unicameral bone cyst. And that's essentially kind of a single cyst. And then there is something else called an aneurysmal bone cyst. And that's made up of multiple small cysts. The way I like to kind of simplify it is a unicameral bone cyst, so this unilocular one cyst. It's kind of like an eggshell, right? It's made up of this like thin rim and it's kind of located within the bone and it's filled with fluid. And so as a result, the bone is pretty weak. And so there in the literature, they say it's about one in 10,000 children get this UBC or this unilocular cyst. Um, and the thing about it is a lot of children are not symptomatic and often it may kind of resolve by the time they reach adulthood. But there's a fraction that present with pain and fracture. And so that's kind of a nuisance that you have to deal with. And then on the ABC side, they're definitely more challenging to treat. I'd say it's about one in a hundred thousand uh, ABCs out there and kind of the same thing. They can grow. You can potentially have fractures with it, but it's kind of a locally aggressive bone tumor. That's just a nuisance to treat. Is it, um, do you, is it cause a deformity on the child or is it usually just something you see, you know, after doing an x-ray cause they have pain? Um, if it, you know, if it fractures, obviously it can cause a deformity. And the other thing is if the cyst is kind of near the growth plate, right. It can affect the, the growth of the arm in the future. Ah, oh, yeah. Growth plates. So every time I see those x-rays, I get, I get scared <laughs> and, and, and close the, uh, close the image. <laughs> um, so what, what's the treatment, right? You know, um, other than, uh, uh, what, what's the standard of care right now for their treatment? So the standard of care is variable. So I guess let's start with the, the simple cyst that, you know, locular cyst is the standard of care provided by orthopedic surgeons is if it's a non-symptomatic cyst, that's just kind of incidentally noted, you may just watch it, right? But if it's presenting with pain or it's so thinned out and it's about to fracture, um, an orthopedic surgeon could make an incision a few inches uh, long, go in there and kind of scrape the wall off the cyst, essentially kind of disrupting that wall lining and then packing it with graft. And so that's called curatage and grafting. In certain situations, they may ask interventional radiologists to put a needle in there and inject some steroids, which can also kind of help the cyst essentially resorb. And the thing is the recurrence rates are still relatively high. So with, you know, with the IRS injecting the steroids, they say the recurrence rates around 50% or so. And then with curatage and grafting by an orthopedic surgeon, recurrence rates are on the order of about 30%. Um, 
And then, so then there's the ABCs, right? And that's made up of the multiple other multiple cysts. I kind of like to think of that as kind of like a, a honeycomb essentially. And unless you are able to get into every one of those cysts, it's likely that it's going to recur. So once again, a orthopedic surgeon may go in there and do like an unblock resection, kind of take out the whole thing. Or an IR may inject, get a needle into each one of those cysts and sclerose it, kind of using doxycycline to essentially burn the cyst wall lining and eventually the cyst heals in. Usually requires multiple procedures or so to do that, to accomplish that at least. Okay, okay. Sounds uh, tedious. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what, you know, we're going to talk about your treatment now and what you've done. So, so what, what is the difference now? What are you doing? So this all kind of, you know, we started this, I think it was back in 2017 or so. And it, it was actually a child um, that had had a cyst in her arm and it had fractured like three times, right? And then subsequently an orthopedic surgeon um, had gone in there, curated it and grafted it, right? And they thought we, they were done, but they had a recurrence. At that juncture, she was told, there's nothing more I can offer you, right? And so this kid, I believe, was a softball player and was a dancer. And essentially because of the location was told there's, you have an activity restriction. And maybe this cyst will kind of go away by the time you reach adulthood. And they were 10 at this time. Family was obviously devastated. And so they came up to Lurie for a second opinion. And that's when we chatted. And I was like, I think we can do something different here. So what we proposed was doing a chemical burn. And that to me is kind of like a surrogate for someone going in there and mechanically curtaging the wall. So we get two needles into the cyst. Um, you inject contrast to confirm that it's like this one big cyst. And then we inject doxycycline, which is a sclerosin, which goes in there and does a chemical burn on the inside. And so to me, that is kind of the equivalent of someone doing a mechanical curatage. And then I fill it with this bone paste. And essentially the way I like to think of it is essentially it's kind of a scaffold um, and it just recruits osteoblasts to come and build bone there and make the bone stronger immediately. And so what was neat about it is, you know, before I made my two incisions with my two needles, I could see her previous cure tire scar, right? And it was about four inches long, four or five inches long on a a young, uh, on a young teenager. And I got away with doing this whole procedure with two needles such that afterwards there really isn't a scar and didn't even require stitches. And there was a small bandaid on there. And then, so, you know, the sclerosis burns a cyst wall and then now we've grafted it and the bone just slowly heals in. And then by, it was almost at one month, you already saw a bone thickening. And we were able to return the kid to normal activity at two months. And now I think we are three years out essentially. And, you know, the humerus looks completely normal. And so that was kind of our first child that we did with a UBC. We've now done on the order of like 23 to 24 kids. And the results are really, really promising with this, which I like to think of as a very elegant way to fix this problem. And our recurrence rates have been somewhere in the order of 15% you know, or so. So kind of better than the existing data, but mind you, it is still early and, you know, we will continue to publish and hopefully get our results out there. That's awesome. I mean, so, I mean, how big are these needles are you talking about? Are they, you know, are, are you sclerosing with like a 20 gauge needle or something? Or are you going big? Are you going like a 15, 10 gauge? What, what, what needles are we talking about? So if I was just doing sclerosis, cause honestly the bones are so thin, it's like literally requires no pressure to get into it. I could just use an 18 gauge needle, but I obviously need a bigger needle um, to get my graft in. And so currently I find it easiest to get my graft in using a 11 gauge needle, but hopefully we can get better graft out there such that we can get it in through smaller needles. This graft stuff sounds pretty awesome. What, what, I mean, this is actually, so you're, you're saying the bone looks normal after on, on, uh, on x-ray, like uh, three years later, I mean, Looks completely uh, normal. Yeah. So, you know, I'm on the adult side, right? So I guess this is where kind of the difference is like when you are doing a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, right? Y'all are injecting cement in there, right? Mm -hmm. And that stuff is permanently there all the time. This stuff is, so there's multiple different companies that make bone 
um, pace. And to me, they're essentially all the same. Um, but it's the one I use happens to be calcium sulfate, kind of calcium phosphate, acts as a scaffold, recruits osteoblasts to come and build bone on there. And then essentially in a few months, about six months or so, the graft is essentially gone. And so what's kind of neat about it is it's kind of forgiving because if you do leak out into the muscle or something like that, it's gone in about three to six months, unlike if you were to use cement. And the thing is why um, I don't want to use cement is these children are obviously growing, right? And this allows the bone to kind of grow normally. Wow. That yeah. sounds awesome. I, I want to use it for my vertebroplasties now. <laughs> See, the, thing, the thing is, I think why it may not work as well on the adult side is cause they may be osteoporotic or something like that. So they may not form bone as well as a child does. And oh. that's why my graft, you know, works well in kids. That's awesome. I mean, uh, and then, I mean, are they using this? I mean, this is a graft that they use surgically now. I mean, you're, you're adopting it from surgery or, or, or where exactly. did you get it from? Exactly. It's a surgical graft that orthopedic surgeons use that I just happened to borrow and then I've kind of jimmy rigged it to kind of work in the IR setting. I would love okay. to have IR specific graft because um, yeah. I think there's a lot of things we could do with it. Well, no, I mean, that's amazing. Just, you know, that's that's part of the field, right? Of, of interventional radiology and other things is just, just adopting and, and being able to kind of think out of the box. I mean, are yeah. you, the, there was, so we, we've talked about, you know, short-term and long-term. I mean, uh, what's the longest follow-up you've had? It sounds like 2017 was your first case. So about four years, how's that kid doing? I mean, they are, um, the yeah, x-rays are normal. You know, we just follow them along. And every time I do interact with them, they're so ecstatic. And she is so happy that because of, you know, she was essentially kind of the first kid that had this done, that so many other kids have benefited from this. Because now yeah. I get a lot of kids that have kind of failed um, treatments. But now also, because there's a lot of buy-in, and I'm very fortunate at the institution that I am at, I happen to work closely with Dr. Peabody who is an orthopedic oncologic surgeon who was at one point the head of the AOA. And he's a big believer in this. So essentially, I am now pretty much seeing every bone cyst at the institution, the UBCs, because there's so much buy-in as to how well it's working. And then now, you know, we haven't really talked about the ABCs, which is slightly different, but even those more and more are coming to IR. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you mentioned you, you're collaborating now with ortho, which is great. I mean, it doesn't, it sounds like this is a very symbiotic thing. I mean, yeah, a unicameral sounds almost easier. I mean, aneurysmal, when you have lots of cysts, how do you do that? So that's, so unicameral, it's like when I get a request and it's a unicameral bone cyst, I'm like usually so excited because I'm like, I'm going to have an excellent result here. ABCs, a little bit more challenging, but I think we are kind of kind of rounding the turn and I think we'll have kind of a standardized treatment. But, you know, so I said like an ABC is kind of like a honeycomb made up of multiple small cysts, mm -hmm. right? And so surgeons hate operating on them because the recurrence rates have been reported as high as 70%, right? And then ABCs, for example, when they're located in the pelvis, really challenging to treat because that requires a big whack to go in there to like fix like an ischial okay. or an iliac ABC, right? So they, often yeah. the go-to was IR, go in there with small needles and sclerosis. But unless you get into every one of those small cysts, like if it's this little honeycomb, right, um, it's going to recur. And so that's why it often required four or five treatments from an IR. And mind you, this is always under general anesthesia, right? So it's a long process. So then here at Lurie, we were like, can we be more aggressive about this? And so, like I said earlier, I consider these like benign aggressive bone tumors. So we started getting needles into it and kind of freezing them. Kind of, and so essentially, hmm. it been cryoablation. And what we noticed was this killed the cyst, right? But then we, but then it took, once again, it took kind of time for the whole cyst to heal in. So what we started doing, um, and now I think we've done about five kids or so, is we get needles into the cyst. And like I said, it's a honeycomb, right? I use a kyphoplasty balloon to crack the whole system. So a cyst that's made up of like 50 cysts, I've cracked it essentially making it a unilocular cyst, right? So I've made my ABC a UBC now, right? Because I've made yeah. anti into one because I've cracked yeah. it. And then I do the sclerosis and then I graft it. And then there are times, you know, there are like small cysts on the periphery, which I haven't been able to crack. 
I just kind of freeze those on the edge. And so now we're grafting ABCs by going in with a Kaifu balloon, cracking the whole thing and then grafting it. And once again, results are really neat thus far. That's, I mean, you know, um, I guess, I guess we talked about challenges of peds. I mean, you really have to think out of the box. I mean, I don't even, I, I've never treated any kind of cystic bone lesion in my entire practice in adult. And it's, it's amazing that other stuff that you see are, are, are not even like think about, um, yeah. you know, I, that, that's, that's awesome. All the stuff that you guys are doing. I mean, how, how does someone, you know, learn? I mean, th- what you're doing obviously is kind of cutting edge. It's n- new. I mean, are, are, can people learn this or can, should people try this at, you know, at their institution? How do they learn it? So, you know, what I like about IR is I think often we have very elegant fixes to complicated situ- um, disease processes, right? What I've just proposed with the UBCs, I think is so straightforward mm-hmm. that pretty much anyone could do it, right? So I presented this at conferences and hopefully our paper comes out soon, but I really think you could just read this paper and anyone could do it. That's how easy we've made it. And I think those are often the best solutions in medicine, such that you could like almost read a paper and be like, wow, it's that easy to do. And that's what's cool about IR, right? We've always talked about this as always innovating and coming up with novel ways to kind of fix very difficult situations. So yeah, I don't think you need to come shadow me to know how to put two needles into a cyst. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, seriously, it's... uh I mean, I do think that uh, any any of our listeners who are interested in pediatric IR, go to Lurie's, go 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 uh, shadow uh, Shanks and and see the kind of crazy stuff they do. Because when I was there six years ago, literally all I did was DJ tube exchanges and pick lines. Got good at ultrasound, but they are doing so much more now. I mean, what what are some kind of you know, words of wisdom to, to some of our listeners, as far as, um, you know, that are, that are interested in pediatric IR. So, you know, I think there is this, it's a fair misconception out there that peds IR is primarily GJs and lines and stuff. And like, you know, we have our separate list of that we talk about cases is that the complexity in peds IR is going way up there, right? I think it was about a month ago, I had a GI bleed in a two-year-old, right? So what do you do? So we have to use the exact same devices that you use, right? They don't make me pediatric specific stuff. And so it was a big bleed coming off the gastroduodenal artery. And then I got into it, right, with a microcatheter and all that. And I realized coils wouldn't fit in it because the whole thing was in spasm. So I'm using glue. Right. So I glued the GDA, you know, all my teaching in uh, fellowship was, you know, we use coils in the GDA when you have a bleed and now we do that. And, uh, and I think I've told you this, we had a kid who had, um, they were four weeks old, right. And they had cholidocolithiasis. What do you do for a four week old that has cholidocolithiasis? On the adult side, it's easy, right? You call GI, GI goes in with a scope and retrieves that stone, but in a four week old, it's a big deal because there aren't any scopes that can make those turns. A surgeon doesn't want to cut down on that. And so IR, all we did was we stuck the gallbladder, got a wire into the duct and used a balloon to push a stone out. So the cases are evolving. Um, and pediatric IR is still in its nascency. There's so much growth left in the field. So for th- especially the med students that are interested in PEDS IR, you know, you can go to our, um, our official website, which is um, spir.org, or you could reach out to any PEDS IRs at any of the children's institutions. You know, I like to think of us as being nicer than the adult IRs <laughs> and more approachable. So we'd be happy to chat with you and give you guidance as to how to go about becoming a PEDS IR. That's awesome. Well, I wanted to congratulate you again uh, for becoming division head of, of uh, Lurie Children's and really, you know, looking forward to seeing pediatric IR, you know, evolve and, and you know, become, you know, a whole generation of a field that, that we can see all these procedures and, and, and really be something that uh, 
that uh, shows amazing growth. So thank you so much, Shanks. Thank you for having me on here. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and show notes written by Marvie Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Roy Kennebrew. Thanks again and see you next time.